Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Eva Erlach and I'm the Community Engagement and Accountability Delegate for the IFRC Africa region based in Nairobi. And I'm going to talk about how we've been listening and responding to community feedback in the Africa region. So what you can expect from this session is that we're going to talk about what community feedback actually is, what type of information are we talking about, we'll discuss why it is uh, necessary and useful to systematically listen to communities. Um, then we'll go through some different ways for collecting community feedback and I'll tell you a bit about what um, like what kinds of mechanisms we've set up uh, as part of the Ebola response and then now also the response to COVID-19. I'll also talk about the interagency coordination on community feedback in the Africa region and our efforts to enhance the capacity of African national societies. And then I'll go through the main lessons that we've learned during the Ebola and the COVID-19 responses and share some resources with you and where you can find them because we have quite a lot of resources that are publicly available um, to you and can help you um, systematically um, collecting uh, and analyzing community feedback. So what are we actually talking about when we're talking about feedback? So there are different types of information that help us uh, analyze and structure the information that we receive from community members. First of all, we have rumors, observations, and beliefs, which is anything that um, people are talking about. It might be true, it might be false, and very often it's a bit of both. Um, we also have the questions uh, that um, people ask us, which is important as it tells us what the um, gaps in knowledge are uh, that people have. So what kind of information do we need to provide to communities? Then very important also the suggestions we are receiving. So any ideas of community members on how to tackle certain issues, on how to improve our way of working. Then we also have complaints, which are a formal expression of dissatisfaction with the program or somebody's behavior. Um, and this can also include sensitive complaints. So here we have to be careful on how, uh, um, on how these sensitive complaints are handled. And we have acknowledgement and praise. So any positive comments about our work um, or about something that, um, that is appreciated by, by community members. Um, which shows us if we are going in the right direction. So important to track that as well. So why do we need to listen to communities? It's all about trust. If people don't trust us, we won't be accepted by communities and we won't be able to work together with communities. So in order to build trust, we need to understand the context uh, and what the information needs are. Uh, we need to understand how the community is functioning and then also and where the community is receiving the information from and then provide um, useful and actionable information to community members and engage them in what we are doing. And how can we engage them? We need to receive their feedback, their views, their suggestions and analyze what, um, what, what it is that communities are concerned about, what communities are sharing with us. And then we need to act on community's feedback. We need to make sure that we provide the information that was requested. Uh, and we need to discuss what has been uh, suggested by communities, can, what can be done better, um, how can we work together with the community. So I'm sharing this example from the Ebola operation in Eastern Congo, because it's such a great example of what can go wrong and why it's so important to be aware of what communities are uh, saying and thinking. So on the left, we see um, the conversations that, were, that responders were having, the information that was provided by responders to community members. So it was messages about the importance of hand washing, about not touching dead bodies, and about going to the treatment center if you suspect um, someone um, has the disease to make sure this person can survive. On the right side, we see what community members were worried about. 
there were rumors about the burial teams harvesting organs and um, and selling them to Kinshasa. There were rumors about it not being real people that are buried, but empty coffins or stone and cement. There were rumors about people being injected with poison at treatment centers, about people being transported to treatment centers without being sick, uh, and then killed there. Um, and this all to increase the number of cases and to make a living out of death. So if you're afraid of your loved ones' um, organs being sold, if you're afraid of being killed in Ebola treatment centers, you won't care about the importance of washing your hands or not touching your dead bodies. You will care about saving yourself and your loved ones from this threat. So if we are not aware of these rumors that are circulating, if we are not aware of these fears of people, we will fail right from the beginning. It's important to address these issues and build trust by engaging with communities, by addressing these rumors, explaining what is um, what needs to be done, explaining the processes, explaining why people look like aliens and why they need this certain type of, um, of protection. Otherwise, community members will never cooperate and do everything to protect themselves and their loved ones. So what are the different ways for collecting feedback? There are lots of options. Um, so Red Cross um, staff and volunteers have been uh, collecting feedback during social mobilization activities, for example. So during households or campaigns in public spaces, they would um, record what they are hearing from communities on simple paper forms or using mobile phones. Um, there are also interactive radio shows that can be used for um, collecting feedback, radio shows where people can call in and ask questions or send um, comments or questions via text messages. One can organize focus group discussions for um, discussing a certain issue or, or receiving information. Key informant interviews are an option, WhatsApp groups um, in case you do not have access to a certain certain area, especially relevant during the COVID-19 response, social media, hotlines, but also structured perception surveys can be, of course, be used for um, collecting feedback. Or if you have very limited resources uh, in time, you can also receive the main trends from communities through focal points um, in, in a certain area. So the Ebola community feedback mechanism was set up in the beginning of the Ebola response um, in, in August 2018. And during this operation, more than 800 volunteers um, have been listening to community members during social mobilization activities and have been recording more than 1 million feedback comments. All this information is then coded and analyzed locally and um, then presented in coordination meetings, in internal team meetings, as well as external coordination meetings, making sure that this information is shared with the broader response and can inform concrete actions. So these presentations would be followed um, by a discussion of com concrete actions that need to be taken to react to this community feedback. What is important to mention is that it's unstructured um, feedback that is being collected and, and quali lots of qualitative comments. And so in the beginning, it was uh, a challenge to establish a system that um, allows us to, uh, to, to analyze all, um, all this uh, qualitative information in real time. Um, but by training uh, local staff and volunteers to do so, we were really able to, um, to um, together and present this information uh, in real time and it's the first time um, and it was the first time that such a system was set up in a humanitarian operation. And during the COVID-19 response it um, immediately became clear that such a system is necessary as well. Um, it was clear that there was a lot of um, rumors and mistrust um, in the, in the operation. So we had to find appropriate and realistic ways to collect and document community feedback across the region because the COVID um, response affects, um, affects the whole region and even the whole globe. 
So we took the tools that had been piloted in the during the Ebola operation, simplified them a bit and um, just adapted them for the COVID-19 response and um, provides regular support to the African national societies that are collecting feedback through various different channels. And these national societies then share the um, feedback data with the regional office on a regular basis. So the feedback is then analyzed on a regional level um, for regional information products and, and discussion. So the qualitative feedback is coded using a coding frame that was um, adapted to the COVID-19 response with the help of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And uh, we are then able to, uh, to share the main trends we are seeing with the feedback. For example, um, here we have a graph that shows us um, the trends uh, in, in July, where we see that um, the beliefs of who is or is not affected by the disease, beliefs about protective behaviors and questions about protective behaviors were um, most widely spread across the, um, the countries that shared, uh, shared feedback. This information to produce back sheets for our volunteers to make sure that our volunteers know how to answer the trickiest questions, the most frequent questions, and provide them with strategies for addressing rumors and, and misinformation. So here, for example, you saw uh, a common rumor um, that, that was circulating in the beginning of the response, um, where a lot of people were thinking that it's only those who travel, but if you, if you haven't left the country, you would not um, be affected by the COVID-19 response. So we, here we have simple tips on how to answer, uh, answer this question. Um, these fact sheets are, um, are always shared together with, uh, with the feedback report. And, uh, address the biggest issues that we see in the feedback. And we also produce videos where health experts um, answer questions or or discuss um, the discuss the biggest issues, which can then uh, be shared on WhatsApp and in social media. But I also want to stress that it's not only about the information that we're pro providing to communities, but also about what we do about um, the um, the information we are receiving. So coming back to the rumors about burials during the Ebola operation in Eastern Congo, where people were afraid of um, the dead bodies not treated properly, about um, organs being traded, and also people thinking that it would not be uh, real people that are buried but stones or cement. So when discussing this, uh, this issue, it was decided that um, one would change the body bags used. So new body bags were introduced uh, with a window that can be opened. Um, so it's transparent fabric that shows um, the families that it is really their relative that is inside this body bag. So this has really increased uh, trust in the process because family family members can um, can be reassured that everything is going according to protocols and nothing is happening to the to the dead bodies. Another examples were um, concerns about access to water during the COVID-19 response in Cameroon, for example. So across the region, community members have been sharing um, concerns about not being able to wash their hands if um, they don't have water. So this again can lead to frustration if we keep repeating messages such as wash your hands with uh, soap and water to make sure you protect yourself. Um, if you are, you do not have water to wash your hands. Um, so what uh, the Cameroon Red Cross did was to share this information with the coordination for the COVID-19 response with the Ministry of Health. And it was discussed how one can respond to, to this feedback. And this advocacy on people's needs has led to the construction of boreholes. Uh, the third example, uh, is the mistrust in information provided by governments. Again, during the COVID-19 response, um, and again, something that has come up across the region. So here it was crucial to understand what are the information channels that are most trusted by community members uh, and to work with those stakeholders of the community. So what the Burundi Red Cross, for example, is doing um, is that they are trained and are now working with um, a network of community leaders that can share the information um, 
that is needed about the disease, about the COVID response in general with community members. So this ensures that community members get the information that they need to protect themselves from someone they actually trust. So we must be aware of these issues in order to come up with um, approaches for risk communication and community engagement that are effective and that um, assure that community members receive the information they need. But what is extremely important during a public health emergency is the interagency coordination on these areas. Um, different partners have different approaches and hear a lot from community members. So we need to make sure that we are sharing this information with other responders that might have different mandates um, and different areas of expertise to make sure that we are complementing each other's actions, that we are um, that we are discussing our strategy to risk communication and community engagement together, making sure that we are sharing and discussing the main feedback trends and encourage action across the pillars and agencies. So in the Africa region, we've set up sub-working groups to RCCE working groups that are focusing specifically on community feedback. This was piloted in the DRC uh, Ebola operation. And during the COVID-19 response, we were able to set up these groups, um, both for East and Southern Africa, as well as West and Central Africa. We now have a big number of partners that are participating in these groups, getting together, sharing the main trends that, I see, that they are seeing in their feedback. Um, and we then get together to discuss what action is needed from the different pillars of the response to really address this feedback. And we also follow up on this feedback. So making sure that this information is discussed in coordination meetings, uh, that there is concrete action uh, agreed upon that can be followed up upon. So here you can see the main structure. So partners would share the main trends they are seeing in their feedback during a certain period of time. And then in the working group meetings, we get together to discuss concrete actions to address this feedback. We then prepare PowerPoint presentations and reports, um, which are shared widely, and also have presentations of this feedback with um, the different technical working groups, um, where we um, present our suggested recommendations and discuss um, with the different groups what is possible, what has already been done, um, and also keep track of, um, of the actions to respond to this feedback. So what we've been doing in terms of capacity enhancement of the national societies we are supporting is that we have started a process of strengthening the way the feedback is collected, analyzed, and acted upon. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we share tools and guidance on how to um, record feedback, on how to report on the feedback. And we also recently developed a simple Excel tool, which can be used for the analysis of the coded qualitative feedback data. As the data is analyzed on a regional level, we are able to share this um, feedback then back with the national societies to make sure that they can engage with the data, um, filter the data, find out uh, what they um, find out the details that they want to know more about and can then report on the feedback for the specific country. Um, so we are organizing regular webinars in both English and French to discuss the tools, to discuss challenges and most importantly to um, learn from each other, to hear how it's going in one country or the other, um, to provide each other um, uh, guidance and, and tips, or to ask questions and um, discuss how we can improve together. So the main lessons that we've learned during the Ebola and the COVID-19 response are first and foremost that we need to build trust to end an epidemic and to build trust we need to listen to community members and we need to act on the feedback um, we cannot only extract information and keep collecting feedback and report on it and think that this is all it needs to be a cycle it needs to be a whole feedback system so we need to think about how can we act on uh, the feedback what is possible and what is not and we need to go back to communities to tell them how we have taken their feedback into account and what we are going to um, do to respond to their needs and if it's not possible to explain why it's not possible. Then 
the importance of moving beyond messaging and supporting community-led solutions. It does not make sense to repeat messages if they are not relevant, if they do not respond to what um, communities are actually talking about and most concerned about. So we need to make sure that um, our risk communication and community engagement uh, approaches go beyond the risk communication and uh, identify the solutions that we can find together with communities so they can contribute themselves and find the own, their own solutions that are um, working in their specific context. The third lesson, which is linked to the previous one, is that if we want to change what we do and not only what we say, we need the involvement of everyone involved in the operation. It cannot be the those people that are working on risk communication and community engagement and that are taking the operational decisions. But there needs to be a dialogue within the team to discuss what is possible to address communities' needs. So there needs to be ownership and, and buy-in from the leadership into that process to make sure that the community feedback is regularly reviewed and informs um, decision-making. The next lesson is that interagency coordination of feedback can drive concrete action. It has been a pleasure to see how we moved from just sharing the information to actually concrete discussions of what we uh, and others um, that are part of the response can do together. So first of all, to understand what the main trends we are all seeing and then to think together how we can complement each other, what are the things that we can do to uh, efficiently uh, address the community feedback. The fifth lesson that I want to share is uh, the fact that regional discussion can, uh, can influence the strategy and is extremely important, but the concrete action needs to happen on a local level. So we need to make sure we have local processes that can be supported by the region, but the concrete discussion of the community feedback, what is possible and what not needs to happen on the, on the country level, on the district level. Um, so we need to focus on building the, the, the capacity of our local colleagues, making sure that the feedback is interpreted and acted upon on a very local level. So as I mentioned, there are a lot of resources available to you. The IFRC has, for example, developed a feedback starter kit uh, that can be used for any type of co um, context, um, which provides tips and tricks of setting up and running a feedback um, system. Uh, it includes standard operating procedure, um, forms that can be used, an Excel logbook that can be used, um, as well as a, a template for a community feedback and complaints report. Uh, and then um, for the COVID-19 response, a lot of resources have been developed as well. So for the Africa region, we have a feedback form, Excel log sheets and templates for reports. All this information is available on the Community Engagement Hub. So you see the link here and I would highly recommend you to follow this link because there are loads and loads of really useful resources um, on community engagement and accountability, but also COVID-19 specifically. So if you have any questions or comments, please do reach out. I would be happy to hear from you and really hope you enjoyed this session.